talk about uh, Beyond MySQL and what's been happening in this space for the last eight or nine years, because the IDB or Pink App has been around for eight years now, and it's maturing into a fine product. And it's a distributed SQL, unlike MySQL, which is like a single node, but then you have add-ons like replication and group replication that I'll talk about, and then I'll talk about what IDB is and how it works. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. You can ask me later, but even during the talk, you can interrupt. There's not that many people, so we can figure it out. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I work for PinkCap now, and I've been at PinkCap for two years. I've been working on databases for a long time. I used to be the lead at MySQL of the InnoDB team, and that's my Twitter handle. Uh, we have this raffle thing going on, so if you have some, you want know, to join the raffle, you can just scan the code and it should work. Okay, all, any, everyone's done with it? Okay, so a little bit of history. <laughs> it's, a, it's pretty long. So it's a, this is more about MySQL replication or history. So it started as a single node system. In 2000, they had replication, which was just moving SQL statements from one MySQL to another using the bin log. It, it's asynchronous and it's been asynchronous since then. Group replication was released in 5.7. It supports multiple writers, but that has its own issues and they don't recommend it, but they have it, so I should mention it. Default is still asynchronous. It has consistency. It's eventually consistent, so it's not uh, synchronous. Replication lag is an issue. DDL is a big issue. If you have large tables, uh, and it's a DDL itself is a single node operation. And you can get stale reads, which is because it's asynchronous. And the maximum number of nodes in a single group is nine, which I don't think anybody runs. They usually run four or five. So at seven, the performance is pretty bad. The next evolution in the MySQL space was with MySQL Aurora. It was announced in 2014. The big innovation there was that the scale and storage, the, the compute and storage were disaggregated, so you can run them independent. So they had a storage layer, which was scaled, and then they had one single writer, and they had uh, multiple readers, and they re replicated the read log of InnoDB. It's still limited to 128 terabytes, and this is because of they use a single table space to store everything, and InnoDB is actually limited to 64, but with a bit of trickery around bit fiddling, they've moved it to 128 terabytes, but it's still a single table space that is Shared, uh, it's part of their shared storage. So I won't go into details of Aurora, this is just a simple list. There is also Vitess. It's more of a sophisticated proxy of, over a cluster of MySQL nodes. It requires manual sharding. The application needs to be aware of the manual sharding, so your application changes. The sharding ID has to be passed around. Resharding is, as I've said many times, it's like a masochist dream. It's just painful at scale when you have to do it. Latency can be lower with this architecture, though. So if you are hitting one single node for uh, your request, the latency will be much better with the Vitesse architecture than the others, but you have to pay the price of how it all works. It doesn't have consistency across all the nodes. It doesn't even support uh, repeatable reads beyond a single node. So when you do two nodes, if, let's say, as an example, if you have three your commit is over three nodes from the application side, and two of them commit and the third fails, there's nothing Vitesse can do. That burden is moved to the application developer to figure out what to do. So it can cause bigger problems if it's, you don't understand how it works. So that has its own problems. The next big breakthrough was in Spanner. So they used the same idea from Myers and Aurora, the disaggregated compute and storage but they have proper distributed transactions, and you can have multiple readers and writers, and the storage itself can be scaled out 
almost infinitely, but obviously the limits, but it really was. TDB, TIDB, sorry, was inspired by Google Spanner. So the TIDB founders used to be, they were working for an internet company in China. And one of the big problems, and these were the good times, and everybody, when things were scaling really well in the mid, like 2010, 2012, and they, have, they were constantly sharding and resharding to handle that scale. And they were using MySQL. And they thought there must be a better way to do this. And so when they came across Google Spanner paper, this inspired them to try something in the MySQL space on how to scale like Spanner. And the current architecture is version two. Version one was writing the SQL code or node and then having HBase, and that didn't scale well, and then they changed the architecture to, architecture to what it is today. So what's TIDB's unique value? It's open source, it's reliable, it's been, it works at hundreds of companies, if not thousands now, especially in China, but also here, Databricks, uh, Pinterest, uh, a few others that we can't use, but it's working here in the US too. It's multi-tenant ready, so for example, at uh, Airbnb, I think, they consolidated something like 440 Aurora nodes, MySQL Aurora nodes into 50 or 60 TIDB nodes, and they consolidated their application to run on that cluster. It, it's versatile, it can run across game, games, logistics companies, web scale companies, uh, any kind of load you can throw at it, it does pretty well. It's MySQL 8 compatible, and it's really trivial to set up and start. So if today you want to try it, just go to tiup.io, just download, do a copy and paste, and you can, it'll be up and running in five minutes. So it's very easy to set up. It's that same tool that is used to scale it out to thousands if not hundreds of nodes. And you can start with the sandbox immediately if you want. So it's really easy to set up. So these are all the companies that are using it in production. And there are many of these that are running it at 800, 900 terabytes. And at that scale, there are many things that MySQL is not so good at. DDL is, for example, like a big problem. And I'll get into the details of how TIDB works and handles all that stuff. So first we'll do the design fundamentals, then a bit of resource control, how you can use resource control for multi-tenancy and other things, how online DDL works, and some of the tools that are part of the whole TIDB uh, ecosystem. So this is our reference architecture. And there is one part of this that I just want to highlight, and that's what's called TIE Flash. TIE Flash is what gives TIDB the ability to use the same data for analytic workloads. So in the same query, for example, the TIDB optimizer can send part of the SQL request to the OLTP node, which is TIEKV, and anything that can be, can leverage the column store with its own multi uh, MPP engine, that goes to TIE Flash. So, it, so this is like called HTAP. So it has three main components. If, uh, if we take out tie flash, tie flash is optional. You don't have to use it, tie flash. It's something called the placement driver, which is like a metadata server, tie KV, which is a scale out storage system, which also does transactions. And then there is the SQL layer. And there are three, these are the three main components. And you can do OLTP, it uses RAF for consensus, uh, data consistency is guaranteed by tie KV. Tie KV is an Apache, or is a, CNCF graduated project. So it's uh, region, so people who are familiar with, let's say, Google Spanner, region is the equivalent of a tablet in Spanner. Or you can think of it as, if you don't know what a tablet is, think of it as a page. That's the closest you can, if you're used to database, it's like a page. Uh, it's fault tolerant and it works across uh, availability zones. So, one other thing you can notice is that you have four nodes, and let's say you look at the little arrow there, so think that region or page or tablet is spread out across three nodes, one, three, and four, and then it's also replicated to the column store and converted into a column store format. 
So what that means is that each of these pages, there'll be three of each, is a raft group. So there are, each page is part of a raft group. So what is replicated is the page, not the entire node like you would have in, let's say, uh, MySQL uh, like group replication. So each page is replicated. This is how it achieves scale out. This is the core difference. So if you have a million pages, all pages are then distributed across. So if you have like a thousand nodes, you, by default it uses uh, three nodes for redundancy. You will have all your nodes spread out. And how they are spread out is something that I'll talk about and that's what PD does. So I'll talk about that in a little more detail. So a region is really its logical scale unit. So think of it as a page if you can't relate it to anything else. So everything that's got to do with moving data around is around the concept of a region. So as I mentioned, a replicated region is a raft group and uh, a single node can contain many regions. But it, each region will have only one leader in a raft group. The other two are followers. And all the data is stored on RocksDB and there is one RocksDB per PyKV node instance. And all the rows in a region are ordered. There's a whole story behind this because by, instead of selecting hashing, uh, we selected uh, this, this is because we wanted to be an OLTP database where range reads are important and so order gives you that advantage. So it doesn't do any hash partitioning, it does range partitioning. So the rows are ordered. So it's important for OLTP and queries. So what's a placement driver? It's a metadata server that coordinates the entire cluster. It's a stateless piece of machinery and it uses ETCD for uh, its own HA. So you can think of it as that you don't want a single point of failure. So each part of each component of PyDB is also, there are multiple of them. And because this is the metadata server, you want this data to be HA and you want it to be uh, resilient. So it runs its own ETCD to maintain its own state in its own cluster. But the process itself is stateless. So I can just start one up, point it to the, 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 its own cluster and the cluster, it stores its data inside TyKV, so remember that. Some of it, not all of it, but some of it. So it's the brains behind the whole uh, TyDB cluster. It's what controls everything. It, it decides which page goes where, if there's a failure, what to do, which nodes need to be copied. It monitors the CPU, the disk, and everything else on, across the whole cluster and load balances dynamically. So these are very powerful things that you cannot do with existing MySQL solutions. You just can't. So this is really genuinely the next level of what a, a database should be, a distributed database should be. And this idea is all from Spanner. It's not as if IDB invented any of this. So it handles, like, like I said, it handles dynamic distribution of, handles node failures. It also handles uh, cluster config, so it can do add nodes, remove nodes, if a node joins, leaves, it monitors, it knows what to do just in case node capacity increases because the node has gone, you've started something else up and the old node comes back on. So it manages all those kind of use cases. You can do multi-zone deployment and for disaster recovery and stuff. So these are the things that I was mentioning earlier. So at the node level, it connects the total and the free disk capacity, the number of regions there are on that node, the data writing speed of that node, because all this is taken into consideration when it uses, when it decides to move data around dynamically. It looks at the snapshot, so because it uses LSM, it can just take a snapshot and transfer it in case it needs to build something. It looks at the, it monitors the CPU, uh, the tagging I won't get into. It looks at, so the, the, the next one is actually very interesting. It also, for, for failure detection, it monitors heartbeat messages from all the cluster. So it knows where the leaders are, it knows which who's dis disconnected, it knows 
who, who, which node, what's being read, what's not being read. So what role does it play beyond this? So now imagine I've run an SQL query from the S to the, I write an SQL query to the SQL node. The SQL node is stateless. It doesn't know what to do. So the first thing it does is, after it sort of, the optimizer has gone through the query, it will then ask the PD for the location of the data inside the cluster. So once it gets the address of where all the data is, then it goes to, so let's say the, the data is spread across, uh, let's say you have three node clusters, the data is spread across, uh, there's a primary on each of the three nodes. It will do a parallel fetch from all three. So it does true distributed uh, access of the data. And it gets the address from where to read the data from the placement driver. As from the name you can tell, it tells you where the placement is of the data. So what are the scheduling strategies it uses? So there is, you know, basically you want to know how many, you want to specify how many uh, nodes you want in your storage cluster. Then you want to know, how do you want, do you want the placement to be per, no, per, per uh, rack, per node, per zone? You can specify all these rules, and I'll, the next few slides, I'll show you the syntax of doing so. You don't need to do all these, but there are specialized cases where people want to do this sort of stuff. They want very fine-grained grain controlled over where to place their data, and this could be for all kinds of reasons. It also balances the space utilization across the cluster. Uh, just in case you, you want to move data from one cluster to another because you want to take something down from maintenance, you can do all that stuff too. It does hotspot detection and mitigation, so it'll start splitting up accordingly, right? dynamically. These are really, in my eyes, very powerful features. It's also, it has a governor which decides how much it should interfere and start doing scheduling, and you can control it. Uh, by default, it's sort of set very conservative. It doesn't move things around too much. But you can control the rate at which that also works. So you create a placement policy using standard SQL. There's no flags or anything. You don't need to start up or do anything. And I won't go over the SQL. It's fairly straightforward. You create a placement policy, and then you can attach it to a table, and you can use DDL for attaching that policy to an existing table, too. So it gives you the flexibility to do a lot of things. And you can drop it, and then it goes away, obviously. So now we'll move on to the other component of the TyKV cl uh, Ty cluster, and that is the TyKV distributed storage engine. So this is what gives TiDB its scale-out uh, property. And the other thing that this TiKV does is it implements a distributed transaction protocol called Percolator that came from, also came from Google. It's not what Spanner uses. This is what TiDB uses. It uses a modified version of Percolator to implement this. So all the TiKV nodes implement this distribution protocol. Because the SQL nodes are now stateless, when they talk to TiDB, the, the transaction part is handled by TiKV. So it simplifies the general architecture. So you can sort of visualize it as a distributed and ordered hash map that is designed for high performance and reliability. So just assume that your, all your data is just one large file that's divided into regions, and it's being shuffled around constantly by PD. So you can visualize it like that. It's a fairly simple idea, like conceptually. So let's take an example. So let's say you have, can you see it? Can you view the table? So let's say you have a table. It splits it up, splits it up to three regions. And so if you have four nodes, it sort of places them evenly across the four nodes. And you can see that TyKV1 is slightly less loaded. So if the new page is created, it'll probably put the leader there and move the other followers onto the other maybe TyKV3 or TyKV4, depending on the characteristics of the node. So maybe TyKV1 is a more beefy node, so it'll move more pages there, so it, it monitors all this. So it knows the statistics. 
and the performance char characteristics of each node. It's quite clever. So, sure. Uh, so all these nodes here are in the same data center? They can be anywhere you want. It doesn't matter. They can be across continents if you want. But then you have to pay the latency price of, let's say, the four, let's say Thai KV4 is in India, for example, right? And the leader is Thai KV1, and that's in the US. So the consensus protocol now will have to send messages across geographical regions to guarantee consistency for, let's say, reg any region that's where the leader is inside Thai KV1. So they can be placed anywhere, but then like anything, you can't defy the laws of physics. You have to pay the latency price. So the way that people deploy these things is slightly different in practice. They, they will never do the kind of deployment I just described. Nobody will do that. They will partition the data first based on their applications for you know, local access and then have as little cross-region across continent traffic as possible. Just like any other database. I mean, you have to pay the price for anything if you're doing any cross continent. But there's nothing stopping it conceptually from doing so, is my point. Yeah? So, one problem you have with distributed storage is that, now imagine your SQL node has to work like a traditional SQL optimizer. So, if it needs data from, let's say, three, four nodes, let's say you're doing an aggregation. So the last thing you want to do is fetch all the rows into your SQL node over the network and then do your aggregation inside the SQL node. So the massive amount of traffic will be extremely slow. So what you do is you do the standard query pushdown. So each Thai KV node also has four types of query pushdown handlers. Uh, no, not four, one, two, three, four, five of them, right? So there's the, so let's take the last one as, a, uh, let's take uh, aggregator as an example, right? So my query has like some uh, select count star across some table. So what it'll do is it'll look for the leaders across the, the cluster, get them to do the calculation of the data that they have, and send the result back to the SQL node and it'll do a very simple aggregation of the results that it gets. So it doesn't have to fetch all the rows and do it. So these are, so this is called the Thai KV co-processor. So each Thai KV node works on the data close to the data. It doesn't, so the whole idea is to minimize moving data around to do results. In reality, if you want to do a count star, you're better off using something like Thai Flash, which is like even faster. Because it, it's a column store, it'll just, let's say you're doing a sum over a column, it'll be faster than any row store. But anyway, that's what the coprocessor does. It's, and it's inside every Thai KV node, is to reduce uh, traffic and uh, make things faster. Let's say you want the top, you have a limit one on your query. That will also be done inside every node, and then the results will go there, and then the optimizer will give you one row back. It can, yes. Even for a since one query, it can spread it, it can. So if you don't have tie flash, then everything goes to tie KV. But if you have a tie flash, because you want super fast analytic queries, the optimizer can figure out what it needs to do to fetch the data from both the column store and the row store in one query. So there's no MySQL code in any of this. This is just all written from scratch. So it's not, it doesn't have any of those legacy, single-threaded, single-node, monolith problems. This is like a true distributed SQL. So I won't go over too much of detail about how Raft works, but this is a rough idea. So the core idea of Raft is, Raft is to elect a leader, and the rights go through the leader. So whenever the, the SQL nodes need to do any rights, if you have, uh, let's say, three node uh, raft group, it will only write to the leader because the leader is always known to be uh, 
the latest data. The follower may not have the latest data. It may be in the process of sending data or whatever it is. And the data is not considered durable until a majority of the nodes in the cluster acknowledge the right. So the leader is always the source of truth. And that's where the SQL nodes get the data from and write, write the right to raft and raft then spreads it around. But the reads come from the leader node. So this is like a diagram on how it sort of handles failure. So let's say you have four nodes and you can see there's heartbeats going into the placement driver, the cluster of placement drivers and suddenly a heartbeat for some reason gets interrupted. That means there's a timeout. So it says if it's timed out, it's all configurable. And then it says, okay, then that node is down. Let's assume it's genuinely down. Then it will in start initiating an election between Thai KV2, Thai KV3, blue no, the blue region, and then move the data to Thai KV1 to resolve the problem automatically. So that's what will happen if it detects a failure of Thai KV4. So you don't have to do anything. This is all happening automatically behind the scenes. So it's self-healing is like the more marketing term of around this. So TIDB supports read committed and snapshot isolation. So the snapshot isolation is mapped to MySQL InnoDB's repeatable read. There are some minor caveats which I've mentioned on the website, but they're too minor to talk about here. It should for 99.99999 of the applications it'll just be repeatable read. So it uses, I mentioned this earlier, it uses an optimized version of Percolator for distributed transactions. I won't go into too much of detail. Uh, and that requires a global timestamp. That timestamp comes from PD. And they're also used for MVCC, which is a fairly standard MVCC. One thing that I haven't mentioned is perhaps how data is represented. It's not important, but I'll mention it. So the data is mapped into a key value store. So the, the, let's say as a rough idea. So let's say I have a table T1 and it has an index I1. It'll be written as the key will be roughly, roughly speaking, like T1 underscore I1, so that you can locate the data like that. So that's mapped like that. Also, it can optimize for short queries. So if you're doing single, uh, let's say auto commit single insert, just let's say you're, because you're going to just one region or one page, it can optimize that to a single phase commit. But any, anything that touches two regions by the, can only be solved by two-phase commit. So you have to send it out, and then they have to say, yeah, we both have understood, and then it, it has an optimization to reduce one part of the percolator protocol, which I won't go into. Uh, so it's optimized percolator. But for single node updates, it can do it in one-phase commit. Because it, it, that's easy, that's trivial to do. So it's very fast for short uh, transactions too. But if they, are across pages, then two-phase commit kicks, kicks in. So this is like a classic optimizer, and this is how TIDB does it. The only difference between MySQL and TIDB is that it also has a distributed core processor, and this is the one that question you asked. So this can talk to TIKV and TIFlash at the same time, because it's aware of the topology. It knows what to do, so that's what that does. But this is a fairly straightforward optimizer architecture. I don't think there's anything special except for the distributed core processor. Uh, so it's, a, it's aware of the layout of the data. So this is an example of the question that you asked. This is how it would work in practice. So the executor would figure out which is the, will the, fragment of the SQL query benefit from fetching data from the MPP engine in TIFLASH or will it be easier to get? So whichever parts it needs as part of the query plan, it'll get those parts and then join, combine, or whatever it has to do. It'll do it inside the executor. So that's how it'll actually work. And these, again, so this is a real example of how in a single statement, the table scan will go to the column store, but the other parts will go to TIKV where it needs lookup. 
but for the scan, it'll go to PyFlash. So that's, if you look at that query, that's roughly how it will solve that query by going to PyFlash and PyKV at the same time. So it's optimized to give you the best, most optimal result if it's the data is on column store and on row store. Okay, resource control. Uh, well, maybe running out of time, I think, anyway. So you can, I'll just skip to this part where it's the actual action. So what the thing you want to do with resource control is, there is one classical problem which every database has, and that is you have short queries and then you have long queries. And you don't want the short queries to suffer because of long queries, because users care about the, shorter, the latency of the short queries. They don't care so much about the latency on what they know are going to query that are going to take some time. So how do you, this, this is like a classic universal database problem. So that's one problem. The second is you want to manage multi-tenancy. So you want, these are, this is some application that's, touches this part of the database, and I don't really care so much about this, and it can run a bit slowly, but these queries that run on this other schema or database, they should not be impacted, and they should be much faster. So there's a concept that IDB has called resource control. So this allows you to have multi-tenancy and consolidate your instances and reduce your cost. That's how people are using it, and that's where the, the request came from. So you want to check your CPU, you want to check your I.O. It currently doesn't check network, but it does check CPU and I.O. And it works a little differently in Thai Flash, which I won't go into. I'll just talk about the Thai KV part. Also, backups, you don't want to run them at top speed. You want backups and any behind, you know, compaction or anything you wanted to run in the background and not chew up all your CPU and your I.O. So all, they are, all of these are scheduled through the resource group. So it's a logical container, and there are three important parts to this. One is, let's say the, the bucket size, more easy to say this. Uh, and this is how much quota you give it per second, so that's the backfill. And it, you specified when you create the resource group. The second is a priority, low, medium, high, so these are, which means when the query is broken down inside uh, Thai KV and when the information is sent from the Thai, Thai DB node, the scheduler will look at the priority and decide whether to give it more CPU time or disk uh, or not. That's basically it. Burstable is interesting. So if your resource group has burstable you set it to burstable, it means that if there is excess capacity, but this query has run out of its RUs, don't worry about it. Give it any unused RUs, that this is that important. But, and the other thing it means is that this query is so important that even if it's, the system is loaded, this must execute. That's the second property it has. Don't suspend it because you want to balance the system out. Make sure that if there's unused resources, give it to this, any query that's running with the, in this resource group, and it must run all the time, because it's that important. So that's the burstable flag. So the whole theory behind this actually is from a VMware paper from 2017 or 18, I can't remember. And so it uses a weight and constraint based scheduler. I won't read out that whole text, but the gist of it is, one is proportional sharing, and the other is like a minimum time that's required to run a query. And there are different costs. Like a read is, a write is the equivalent of uh, eight storage reads or two read batches, because writes are considered more, exp more in, uh, CPU and disk intensive, let's say. And uh, three milliseconds that your query runs is considered as one resource unit. That's how the calculation is done to balance and schedule everything. So it's fairly straightforward. How do you set it? You do it through SQL again, no special syntax. So you go create resource, it creates a resource. You can even say, 
create, uh, calibrate using the load from you know, this time to that time or from this time and duration 20 minutes and it will look at the historical data and calculate and calibrate and figure out what the, the resource unit quota should be for whatever you're looking at. So you can look at historical data and calculate uh, these things too. So it makes it really easy to set up and use. And then you can fine tune it by hand if you want. I mean, this stuff is, this is required for any multi-tenant system and this, this is why in my talk I wanted this to be like the next generation where we, my SQL should be going. So how do you do these things? So you can create a resource group. In the first example, it has burstable set, and RU per second is 1,000, that you can, uh, query can only consume 1,000 RUs. You can use regular alter resource, set the priority high, change the RU per second, you can drop it. You can say show or select from information schema, so you can do all this using just like a regular SQL. So it's very powerful stuff. Here's the other interesting part. You can do it at the user level, session level, and the statement level. So the granularity goes right down to the statement level. At the statement level, you give it the regular SQL hints through comments. And otherwise, it just works uh, through uh, specifying whichever user you want to set it to. So you can tag queries and say, this one I want to run as per the configuration of that resource group or some other resource group because, I don't know, that's just what you want to do. So this is just, I'll hand wave my way through this. Uh, so this is how it works. There's the TiDB SQL server, the storage nodes, which do the scheduling, and the data of the resource group is maintained by the metadata server, which is PD. And so there's the admission layer, then there is the calculation part of it, and then the scheduling is done inside TiKV. Because that's where you are accessing data, that's where you, you're spending your time in doing the real work. So the TIDB's calculation or optimizer is not counted in CPU usage. It's only in the actual processing of the uh, SQL statement. So if there's any question you can ask me, but it's fairly straightforward-ish. Oh. Okay, this is another very interesting thing that TIDB has. So in a di distributed database, you have lots of storage nodes and lots of compute nodes. And you want to leverage this for your work. You want to spread the work around. You don't want to be working on one node and all the other nodes are just idle. You want some jobs to be working across your entire infrastructure. So the distributed ex uh, execution framework does exactly that. Currently, we use it for background tasks, but it's, we plan to make this available even to foreground tasks. So you can spread the work around across low, low, if, if, let's say I have 10 compute nodes and I have 20 storage nodes and I want five of the storage nodes to do DDL and I want two of those other nodes to do something else, then the distributed execution framework will take that task and spread it around. And currently it works for DDL, import, TTL, analyze, and backup and restore. So you can control what each component in your cluster actually does. So it's, the detail is like a talk on its own, so I'll just skip that part. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. No, the, the, the data will be spread out as per either your placement rules or the default placement rules. But the way they, you import data is actually much faster to do it. Because I'm running out of time, I'll probably show you. Because I wanted to run this. Uh, no, I'll show you. This is because just in case I'm running out of time. So you can generate the SSD files independently and uh, import them directly rather than insert them row by row. So if you're running large installations, you don't want to be inserting rows through SQL. You just build your SSD file through a tool that we have, which will build it offline, and you just instantly attach it to TiDB, and it'll spread it across the cluster. 
So that would be the, if you have large data, if you have like, you know, I don't know, a 500, 100 gigabyte file, you can probably shove it in. But if you have like a one terabyte file or two terabyte, you, this is what you want to do. This is built for very large type of data, but it, it works even with small data. I mean, it's just, it's not that you can't, you can have a three node cluster running on your laptop and it'll work. But if you want to scale, then you want to do one terabyte, you build the SSD file and just shove it in separately. So online DDL, so this is a very big thing for anybody who's dealt with DDL in production and large data. In MySQL, one of the problems is you have to acquire the metadata lock when you do, when you externalize the change of your schema. So what that does is it, you have to wait for all transactions to finish and it's a single load operation and all new transactions are blocked until that change is done. All transactions are blocked. And on a very busy system, this is a problem. Where it's not busy, it's not a problem, because then it's like instant. But on a very busy system, and where transactions are slightly longer than, you have to wait for that thing to finish. In the meantime, updates are coming in, the InnoDB DDL log is being filled up, and that has to be applied, and all sorts of things are happening. And this can cause a lot of problems in production. I've heard many stories around this. So this problem was solved again by Google by a paper they published called Asynchronous, like it's an F1 online schema change, asynchronous. So the core idea, which I may not have time to go through, the core idea there is rather than have a global lock across your entire thing, you want to narrow it down to let's say a table level operation, but even that can have sub-states, which means, let's say state one, you can only do inserts and deletes, and, but you can't do reads, for example, and then it moves to state two, and at any given time, your entire cluster can only work on two versions of the schema. And so by managing these states and moving the schema along in, across these four states, you can, in parallel, do DDL across your cluster with no interruption, no locking. Some of your transactions may fail because you, they're not allowed to do certain operations on that table during what, that substate, but that's about it. There is no global lock. And I'll go through that a little bit. And the reason it's required for a distributed database is you cannot lock the entire cluster. It's, it's close to impossible. So you want everything to work, because now you have multiple schema caches across your entire cluster, which you don't have in a single node MySQL. So what MySQL does is it does a single node operation, blocks, it waits for it to finish, and then it externalizes that and puts it on the bin log, and then it goes to the replicas, and then the replicas do their own, have their own problem. And this can cause a lot of replication lag. On a busy system, this is a very big. So people use external tools, which, read the data and send it across the cluster, and so you have to use all kinds of other, and they have, in the end, none of them can actually overcome the MDL lock. That is required no matter what you do. So yeah, so it's different, because you have to make sure that the entire cluster works, because we cannot do a synchronous update or metadata across the cluster. You just can't. Because everyone has cached that information, and so you have to update all those caches and keep them in sync. So you version all the schemas, and so TiDB, as per the original paper, essentially when you connect and you're doing some work, every, I would say, transaction, it's a transaction, I think, has a lease on the schema. So what that means is that if you can finish your work within this amount of time, the schema is guaranteed to be in time. It could be an old schema, but it is guaranteed to work. The worst case will be that the substate has moved on, and because of the restrictions on that substate, you may have to be forced to roll back or retry. But that's about it. But the rest of your cluster that doesn't touch that table or is not affected by whatever you're doing on that table in that substate, you will proceed perfectly fine. So the granularity is very narrow in this. That is the key point. 
If you want the full detail, the paper is actually worth reading, just on its own. So, this is an example, I, I hope I can explain this in the time. So, this is working backwards. So, let's say we are, we finished the schema, it's public now or externalized, and let's say we're VN. So, you can do select, insert, update, and delete. So, these are the four operations that you may or may not be able to do in the other substates, depending on which substate it is in. That's the key point. And you can only, a transaction can only work on two schemas, versions of the schema at any given time, that's it. And you have a lease, which means if you haven't done your job in, uh, in the lease on the schema, well then that's it, the schema has expired and the transaction will fail when you can't commit it. So these, these are the core concepts on which it works. So we are working backwards to this, from where we started, let's say. So let's say you can do everything once it's externalized. In the previous version, you can't do selects, but insert, update, and delete will work. So if your uh, D DML is insert, update, delete, it'll work. So now that state is called write only. So what about the state before that? Again, select won't work. There's actually a very interesting reason if you are interested in consistency, so isolation level. Reads are what cause problems, because you've, you've done a read and you've sort of gone and done something with the data. That's why reads are most conservative in this scheme. So you can't read, but you can, I won't go with the details. So one of the things that it's doing in this operation is it can take a snapshot and move it to all the nodes to backfill. That's what backfill is. So when you're writing data, you're writing to a normal LSM, which then you can take a snapshot of, it'll take a snapshot of that and move it to the next stage and backfill from there. So insert is always handled. The problematic case is for deletes, and I'll get to it. So when you're in write-only stage, you can do all these things. But delete, you, update will also work, but the problem in an update is an update is a delete insert. So the insert will be handled by the backfill, but the delete will not be. So the delete operation has to be done when the DML is being executed. That's the point here. If it's a little confusing at the moment, feel free to ask me afterwards. It's a, there's some subtle points here. So now it's changed the value to from 40, uh, R46 to VR, so that's a, a delete and insert basically, right? So the insert will be fine, because that will be moved along in the backfill, but the delete will not be. The delete has to be done, otherwise the backfill will not do the delete, it'll only do the insert, that's basically what it's saying. So deletes must happen Updates must happen because they have a delete in them. That's why. They're an insert delete, so that's why the same. But insert at that stage, you can't. When, so when the sub mode or sub state is delete only, you can't insert. So what does the no, no, no in this case mean? So let's assume it worked backwards. It means now the old version is obsolete. Any transaction that had this version when it started, and now the transition has been done to the new schema, they will all start failing but only once, and then you retry and it should all work. That's the benefit of this scheme. So you have these states, so now you can think and go this way. So you have these substates, and each substate, you have to decide in this transition which of these operations will work or not. That's the key point here. And deletes have to be handled immediately, whereas inserts will be pushed forward when you move some of the data into the next state. Anyway, you can, this is a bit, unless you read the paper, it gets a bit uh, interesting. So you can ask me, I'll be happy to share this. So back to the original thing. So there are other optimizations. We can generate and ingest files. Uh, no need to write to the new index in Thai KV. It has no, almost zero impact on, and also with the distributed execution framework, you can easily say, oh, do it on those three nodes and all the other traffic can go to the rest of the nodes and people run like 50, 60, 100 nodes. It's much easier on CPU and IO. The other thing, the last 
point there is that it can use the coprocessor inside Thai KV to do all this data reading and moving around. It doesn't have to go through the SQL nodes. So it does it at the lower level too. And so this doesn't put any, it, it reduces the network traffic if it were done through the SQL nodes. Because you're operating on large amount of data. You're not really doing much except moving data around from one uh, format to the other or whatever your DDL is. So all that is pushed down as much as possible into the storage nodes to reduce data movement. So these are some of the timings. So if you have a 10 terabyte index, it can do it in 47 minutes. If it's a one column key index, if it's a 10 column index, it'll take you one hour and six minutes. And that's on 10 terabytes. On, you can see the config, it's how many PDs, there are eight PDs and uh, whatever that is. So it, it scales linearly. So if, I mean, this is like, see, these are serious numbers. These are not, you know, toy numbers. So if you want serious scale and you have these problems, you should just go right away and install this and run it. It really is that good. Okay, so now comes to the last slide. So these are all the tools that we have, and they're all open source. And you can easily go and contribute and send us patches for any of these things. It's all open source, no problems. And uh, I'm sure people who work with these sort of things, I haven't. They understand these things more than I do. I work on the database storage side of things. I don't work on the operation side of things. So Sam, my colleague, is here. If you have any questions about any of these, I'm sure he can answer. I don't know much about it. I just know that they exist and that this is how we, our customers are using it and uh, you can integrate with, you know, this has great integration through Thai CDC, the change data capture. Uh, then there's Lightning that's very useful for importing data from existing systems. So you can import. We have customers who've done, uh, I don't know, 400 terabytes uh, from Aurora. So, I mean, these tools have all been used to do all those sort of things. So they are battle tested. They're not just toy tools for, uh, you know, 10 megabyte or 100 gigabyte. These are like serious stuff. So you can play with it. There you go. So, I mean, this is like serious stuff. These are, this is what MySQL people should be working in for. And they're just obsessed with heat wave for some reason, which I don't know what the hell they are on about. But this is how a distributed database should work. And I used to work for MySQL, <laughs> and I love MySQL, honestly, I do, I still do. Anyway, so yeah, so these are, when I, we publish this slide, you can hopefully click on these things and uh, the links and get stuff. And that's again in case somebody wants to take a scan of this and win this. And uh, if not, there's also a Q QR code somewhere there. And so thank you. If you have any questions, please ask me. <laughs> yeah, thank you.